I'm hearing it twice. One sec. That was interesting. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wondergraph AMA. Do you hear it twice, Keith? I only hear it once from my side. Yeah. One sec. I am having some interesting. Okay. I think I have it settled. All good? Sounds still good to me. So. <laughs> okay. Well, sorry about that, everyone. We were just having some technical um, issues. I was hearing it twice on my end. But welcome to Wondergraph AMA. I'm here with Keith from Solo. Thank you so much for the time, Keith. Yeah, it's great to be here, Stefan. Thanks for having me on. Always. I'm super excited for you to be here. We have a lot to talk about. So we're going to talk about Solo. We're going to talk about GraphQL Conf. We're going to talk about everything that there is related to GraphQL. So let me get right into it. I'm going to give a quick background. So Keith, you led the product team, or you're currently leading the product team as Solo. You cover a wide range of applications, networking technologies required to build modern cloud applications. Prior to Solo, you were a product management engineering leadership positions at Red Hat. Sun Microsystems and Intel Corporation. So amazing background, a lot to get into there. Let's start from the beginning. So after college, you joined Intel Corporation as a developer, correct? I did, yes. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a while ago now. Um, but like great time to join Intel. Like around that time, actually like uh, Pentium chip had just kind of just come out, right? Like Intel like was just like in this crazy hype, hype, hype cycle and growth and I worked on a team that developed all of the software that ran in their distribution centers. Uh, so like when the uh, chips uh, exited the fab and they just go to a warehouse basically to be shipped. And uh, yeah, it was like really cool and also super stressful in terms of like downtime associated, like like Intel would calculate to the minute what downtime in the distribution center cost them in terms of getting product to market. So it was great. Okay, amazing. And then from there, Interesting. You went into the consulting route. So you were a developer for a large corporation and then you went into consulting. What was the transition into consulting? Um, I ended up doing some B2B stuff at, uh, at Intel after that. We're using like EDI. I don't know if uh, you remember what that was, but basically at one point in history, believe it or not, like, like even for Intel, which was a very modern company, um, they would basically use dial-up modems to exchange electronic transactions uh, through with other companies. So like a company company requested a catalog or let's say like a, a retailer placed a $30 million order for chips. Basically they would, that customer would dial up to something called a value added network and they would basically um, send an electronic transaction, uh, these documents, basically these EDI documents uh, to this van basically who would hold it in a mailbox. And then Intel would separately dial up <laughs> via modem to this van and pull those documents in um, and, uh, you know, you can guess based on the story, it's not surprising that that document then went into a mainframe, <laughs> which then eventually made its way to SAP, you know, on the back end and this kind of thing. Uh, but it was a very interesting area because it was like, um, first, that market obviously was like ripe for disruption and did get disrupted uh, by, by the internet and basically finding secure ways to exchange uh, documents over the internet without requiring that trusted, you know, value added network in the middle, those providers. Um, and that kind of set me off the rest of my career of just looking at like how companies can securely and reliably exchange business context, like data and this type of thing, um, you know, across modern internet protocols. I love that. And I, I, as growing up, I was a little bit like after that. So we did have a modem, we did have a router and things were interesting. Like, you know, like you would be on the internet and it would slow down because your sister picks up the phone or something like right, that. Right. Downstairs, yeah. like, get off the phone, like, please, yeah. but interesting. And you're totally right. It was absolutely disrupted by the internet. And then from there, you transitioned to be a senior staff engineer at Sun Microsystems. Mm -hmm. So you made that transition into an internet facing company. How was it at Sun? Crazy. Like, um, like again, Sun was, I was lucky to be in like a crazy hype cycle there right before the bubble burst. Like Sun had an amazing business. They did this awesome hardware uh, based on Spark architecture. Um, and like every... I was living in the Bay Area then, and um, like every startup uh, basically had SunKit. And so, and then Sun expanded into software, and that's where I came in writing some of the like B2B software um, that companies would use, again, to exchange like, uh, like business on, uh, transactions and this type of thing over the internet um, and a couple of other cool things. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was crazy. That was a really, really high growth time. 
um, big time for Java too. Uh, like Sun was at the center of that. Um, and then unfortunately for Sun, sort of kind of unraveled after the uh, bubble burst, but it was a fun ride while it, while it lasted. It's fascinating you say that because um, I was watching a, um, I guess, a snippet of a podcast with Steve Jobs. And so Sun was the biggest competitor to Apple during the dot-com era. That's correct? Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I don't know where, like, like at that time, well, it depends. Like, so for, like, Sun was very big in, like, the data center and for servers and this type of thing. I don't think Apple was particularly competitive there. They had a product line, but I don't think it was as particularly successful. Um, for graphic design, though, like Silicon Graphics and where some of the founders of Sun came from, then you could probably see, like, a parallel to, to Apple, perhaps. Yeah, so he, he mentioned that, but, I mean, that experience must have been crazy, dot-com boom, and then, you know, being part of one of the biggest companies during the dot-com era. Totally. Like when I joined, it was still very early in my career and I'd never like worked for a company where I had options at that point, basically. Right. And like, so I got this like set of options when I joined and I think the stock split like two or three times in like my first 12 months of, of working there. And I'm like doing this linear progression of like, I'm going to retire by the time I'm 30. Like, this is awesome. You know? And, uh, and so it turned out, you know, by the end they were doing like reverse stock splits for like four, one, you know, kind of exchange ratio and stuff. So it was pretty sad, but it was fun while it lasted. Insane. And then from there, I mean, you joined, I mean, I think one of my favorite companies. So you joined Red Hat. You joined as a solutions architect. You progressed all the way up to principal software engineer and then director of product management. So tell me about your time at Red Hat. That It's interesting because Red Hat, like I've been, now that we're, you know, I haven't even thought about this, but now I'm getting all existential and like meta and thinking back on my career, you know, and it's like, I've been very fortunate to work for companies like in, in high growth uh, phases uh, throughout my career. And Red Hat comes to the same thing. I mean, like definitely had come to prominence with RHEL, uh, but that was prior to like OpenShift and their Kubernetes uh, sort of, uh, um, I wouldn't say it's a pivot, additional line, you know, kind of thing. Uh, also their acquisition of JBoss. Like when I just joined, they acquired JBoss, which was a huge middleware portfolio. Um, and so, um, yeah, that was great. And it was the first time almost all of my career had been in like development, engineering or consulting. Um, and then I thought like, Hey, I'm going to join Red Hat. I knew people there and I'm going to be, I know how to write software. And now if I could just have customers tell me like what they want in the software, then I can do my own startup, you know, and kind of do my own thing. And it was interesting in that experience as a solutions architect, I realized that customers, um, don't actually know the technology that they need, but they understand their business problems very well. And it is your job to basically help them fit their business problems and solve those, you know, with technology. So it turned out the recipe was harder than I thought, um, but it was actually a great segue into, um, into product management. I had founded an open source project when I was at uh, Red Hat, we turned it into a product. The process of building that open source community was very much like product, you know, zero to one uh, and, and sort of finding initial market fit and, you know, understanding where you're competitive and everything. And so going through that, I started to like interact with the product team a lot more and then end up just transitioning to product, which I've been doing since. So you touched on a lot of good points there, like zero to one with a product is hard, but then there's community zero to one and like with open right. source. So there's a lot that we're going to get into. And so you were with Red Hat. I mean, they were exploding. They were doing everything you want. You were owning the product. You were actually getting customer feedback. You were just developing. And then you made the switch quite recently, I think a year ago, to Solo. What made you do that jump after 12 years of Red Hat? Yeah, I had never worked at a startup. So like the companies we talked about, like Intel, Sun, even Red Hat, when I joined, probably had 3,000 people working at Red Hat, right? And so like all very mature companies. And, you know, there's just... Those are great companies to work for, great people, strong cultures, cool technology. But when you get to that size, there's a bit of a battleship sort of mode of like, you can't turn and pivot and this kind of thing, right? And so um, that has, you know, benefits and drawbacks, but I'd never really worked for a company that was in the fight of just like, hey, we constantly are evaluating the market every day and everyone's talking to customers all the time and interacting with the community and trying to understand like how we can help and going through rapid adaptations. And I just felt I needed to put myself in a position where I was making decisions all the time. Sometimes those decisions were validated by the market. Sometimes they, I didn't have the opportunity. And how do you know if you're not you're making good decisions if they can't be validated by the market basically. And so it's, uh, it seemed like a great opportunity, you know, and, and Red Hat's an amazing company. And the only reason I left is that 
like it, I had done a lot and worked with a lot of great people there and I couldn't make Red Hat turn that back into, you know, a 50 person company. <laughs> and so uh, I knew people like Christian Posta, the field CTO, and then I get to meet Adit Levine, our CEO and founder of, of Solo. Uh, just amazing folks, like great attitude, awesome technology. And I was like, oh, this is my opportunity. Like I have to do this. I love that. And I mean, you're totally right. When you're at like a global scale of more than I like to say 15, you know, like that's when you start to get managers and you need people to manage others. And then, but when you get to 3000, I mean, you are like on a cruise ship. You're not on a small right. boat anymore. And so like when you want to turn, you know, you need to crank it 50, 60 knots just to turn it a slight angle. So I, I love that analogy. And then, so you joined Solo. For those of, of us that don't know, what is Solo in like a 30 second elevator pitch? Yeah, sure. So like, let, let's imagine for modern applications, there are three elements of modern applications. One is like decomposing monolithic, like, like very large applications into smaller things, whether you call that microservices or whatever you want to call it, but like distributing your application services, that's one thing, right? And we look at like, how do you package those things? Well, like Linux containers, Docker, that's the way you do that. Everybody knows it essentially, right? Um, then you look at like how you actually compose those together, right? So how do you, what's the runtime environment for them? And how do you actually compose them together from a deployment standpoint? Now you're looking at Kubernetes and things like Ashy and like, you know, Terraform and this type of thing, right? This is well-established patterns in the market. Um, but then how do you connect those services together? Because now they're distributed and now you have a distributed computing prob uh, problem, right? The network itself is fundamentally unsafe. It's not, you know, uh, like it's unsecure or insecure, excuse me, um, not resilient, right? It's prone to failure. And so now you have all these individual services that are forming an application. And so if we want to do, you know, end-to-end -end security, like NTLS have no implicit trust or like zero trust. Um, if we want to do resiliency, advanced deployments like Canary Blue Green, all that kind of stuff. How do you do that? Do you implement it in your application? Do you implement something on top? Or can the network solve those problems for you? And that's ultimately what Solo does. So that was a fantastic pitch. Well, let's go back to the monolith to microservices and then this can kind of transition us into GraphQL Cough. So as an, for those of you that know, Keith is speaking. He's actually giving a key, you know, at GraphQL Comp. Big advocate for GraphQL. Why, where does GraphQL fit that equation of breaking apart this monolith into microservices? Yeah, I think that, so a couple of ways, right? I think even before, so as your applications get more granular, right? Individual services, they're all individually exposing APIs to talk to them. And so it is, I would say an anti-pattern or would be highly unusual to expose that granularity to outside consumers basically, right? So we see like, let's say I'm presenting a set of services to mobile clients or outside my company, right? Um, do I want to expose the fact that each one of those is an independent REST API endpoint, let's say, right? And then, you know, maybe there's docs on those and API definitions. Maybe there's not. Everybody has their unique way of implementing. Even though REST is like a standard, so to speak, we all know from personal experience that, you know, there's like, there's a lot of variability in terms of how people implement HTTP based APIs, right? Um, and so I would say that the first phase shift there is exactly what Facebook and others saw in the early days is exposing these APIs creates these like really big problems for consumers of those APIs, right? How do I see and address the full data graph or just the full set of data, forget the graph orientation first, right? Um, I'm going to all these individual endpoints. Each time it's a round trip to get there basically. So I'm under fetching because I'm not getting all the data I need in one request. And then of course at each one of those uh, APIs, I'm over fetching because I'm getting too much data back anyway. And forget about like at that time, like when Facebook developed GraphQL, it was a performance issue, right? For like, you know, bandwidth wasn't what it was. Now I would say that's probably not such a big deal, but the cognitive load on a developer to understand like how many APIs am I talking with? How much data are they exposing, right? Having a single SDL, single schema that describes data I can address and just getting what I need um, is, is huge still today, right? I ignoring the performance implications from a network standpoint. Um, so like, just to follow on just briefly, like from that, that was the external one. But I think what we're seeing is even internally, folks are saying like, hey, for internal communications, I'm starting to look at GraphQL as the right way of just service to service communication. And then it's so well suited for composition into whether you're using stitching or federation or whatever technologies that you're using to create a composite graph, right? To bring that into a, a, a single graph and a single API. I love that. And Obviously, based on your experience, you have that developer, you know, mindset. And how does that help you now 
in product. So are you still hands-on coding or are you more listening to customer feedback and telling the engineers what we should code? How, how, like what's your day-to-day life now at product? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's interesting because that's been all, like, it's, it was a hard transition when I started. So like on, at Red Hat, I ended up getting um, more on like the management leadership track kind of thing. And I st- each step on that ladder, I got farther and farther away from touching code basically. Right. And I think it's a, probably a natural thing for engineers that maybe go into product management that at first you're like, hey, let me help out with this pull request, right? And then you're like, maybe just doing demos and not actually touching the product code. And then pretty much it all just kind of goes away, right? Uh, so, and that really sucked. And I remember like my first week at Solo actually getting back into not writing code for the actual product, but writing demos and, and, and pulling them together um, was, was fantastic. I think it's so important to be able to touch the technology, right? Even, even as a user or consumer of the technology. Um, so, that's important. I also feel like my engineering background gives me street cred with, uh, with the development team in terms of I'm not asking for unreasonable things. I've, I've worked on the engineering side more with product managers than I have as a product manager working with engineers, basically, right, still to this day. So, I love that. And I love that you say street cred because um, for our European friends, they probably won't know what that is. I, I said oh, that sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I said that word to Jens and he's like, what is it? But not only does it help you out with your team it helps you out with the customers because engineers love talking to engineers engineers don't like to talk to account executives and we're seeing this in our sales cycle that they're like oh i don't i'm so happy i got to talk to you you're an engineer like i know exactly what i can tell you and you'll understand so totally agree you have the street cred with the customers and you have the street cred with your engineers and so at solo now like you guys have built an open source community around glue how was it to build that open source community and how has open source contributed to the success of the company? Yeah, I think that uh, it's been huge, right? Like I think initially, especially at the earliest stages, like getting, establishing a community of use around your product or your offer um, is a key challenge. And one of the things I love, like at Solo, we have this amazing collaborative engagement model with our customers. We start from the very first meetings about you know, what are your goals? Where are you going as a company? What do you need? And then just basically from the POC phases all the way through actually getting them to production, we're right there on every step of the journey. And what that enables us to do is to basically use that customer's unique experience. Like they'll have enhancements they might need or like, you know, sort of like beyond just advice, like there's actually product improvements there that we can then incorporate, not just for that customer, but scale it to all customers. And so I think that that is a key element there of early open source and sort of like community involvement is getting validation on your direction, technically getting that feedback, right? Using that as the base to build, you know, the commercial and enterprise offering for sure. I love that. I mean, all, your questions are, or your answers are fantastic because I was talking about this uh, with a friend the other day. So early on as a startup, when you build an open source community, you will probably get enterprise interest. You know, it's very easy to adopt an Apache 2.0 or MIT license. There's no legal they have to go through. One way or another, they might have some weird use cases and they would like to ask you for something. And the biggest trap I see a lot of OSS companies fall into is building things just for that one company. But you just said it right there is you're getting feedback that you can just take back to your team, but also build for the masses. So, I mean, a lot of, I mean, obviously with your experience, you know that. And so, what were some of the early challenges, if you know, from Solo when you guys were building out the open source? Did you guys have that issue with enterprises? And how were you able to scale it to enterprises, the ones that you have today? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think just looking at, so I wasn't here for the earliest days, but in talking to Adit and everyone else that, that was from the early days and observing Solo from the outside at that point, um, I feel like, like Adit has always had this incredible vision for application networking at all layers of the stack, right? So like Glue, the open source project you were mentioning, uh, was focused on gateway and like API gateway use cases, all right? But then also, uh, so that's like north-south traffic into into Mm -hmm. clusters, right? And then so you have this concept of east-west traffic, which is between services, okay? And then you have like a network underlay that basically connects not only things in the Kubernetes environment, but you may be looking to extend that out to native cloud services, things, virtual machines, things that aren't running in Kubernetes, okay? Um, And so she had this incredible vision from the very earliest days of like, we can be this company that is filling this niche and this market segment, right? And doing it better than everyone else, like on the basis of like open source technologies that are are scaled and used by a lot of people like Envoy Proxy, as an example. Mm 
But it turned out that like the market wasn't ready for that at that time, that full vision, right? And so if you look yeah. at service mesh adoption at that point in time, it just wasn't there yet. You know, it was still very bleeding edge. Istio, like at the time that Solar was founded, didn't even exist yet. And so it like is a, um, uh, it, it, I think at that point, part of that experience was saying like, let's land in an area where there's huge mark like that was an api management and api gateways was an existing market segment for sure kubernetes adoption was rising you're saying like hey as customers are creating more and more cloud native applications where can we fit and, and, and be relevant and i think that adit and the team definitely found a like a great segment to, to build off of there I totally agree and when you say service mesh was early I'm also seeing this with WonderGraph and other companies and with the GraphQL space. Do you still think we're early? I, in my opinion, I still think we're kind of early, but we're moving towards the right trajectory, especially with the adoption of GraphQL. Yeah, with, with GraphQL specifically, like are we are we early? Yeah. Yes, yes, with GraphQL. I see it. I don't have like a quantitative measure that I, that I can use here um, to say like how mature this market is. But my impression is that we have, we've already like, so I think we've crossed the chasm in terms of like customers looking at to deploy GraphQL for sure, right? Like there's like all manner and range of customers, no matter the size, the technical proficiency, right? Like there's like the, the industry, like they are like adopting GraphQL. We see this all the time, right? We're talking to customers all the time as you're sure you are and you see it all across the board. Now, how deep have those customers gone to GraphQL, right? Are they still trying to understand? Do they see the promise of GraphQL? And they're like, hey, like we're doing all of these client-specific BFFs, right? And this is a pain in the butt and we see scale issues here. And so like, we're gonna do GraphQL and now I'm taking my first steps with it. Maybe I have it in dev, right? You know, and I have a plan to get it to production. And so I think that's kind of where the market is at right now with GraphQL is that there is mainstream adoption but I would say we are not at mainstream production deployments in the full, even the early adopter category of the market. I think we're still, those folks are still in like dev and, and, and getting to production probably. Um, I, I totally but, agree yeah. with you on that. Fantastic. Yeah. And I, I think that there are, there are definitely huge companies that are doing crazy stuff with GraphQL in production at like, monster scale and not just like the Netflixes and the metas of the world, right? There are like traditional businesses. Like I've seen talks from Intuit before on, on their environment, but uh, at previous conferences and at GraphQL Comp, they're going to present as well. Um, and so it's like, I think that there are like, like non like bleeding edge technology businesses, right? Like I think Intuit would probably define themselves as a software company, you know, and, but like, uh, like it doesn't take just like the, like, the, 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 the most advanced vanguard Bay Area, you know, kind of um, uh, enterprises to, uh, to do this anymore. Like real companies are doing it at scale in production for sure. Totally agree. And like to give an example of that one. So we've been talking with uh, cloud kitchens. They provide everything you need to set up a ghost kitchen and okay. they're using GraphQL. They do with GraphQL 10 to 30 billion requests a month. And that's not a that's traditional crazy. software company. They, you take a money, they go and they set up a ghost kitchen for you. They manage the POC system and everything. It's not traditional software, but it's amazing to see the adoption. You're totally right. It's going from startups into dev, but there are some main companies using it. You, know, you got the Zillow's, yeah. you got the Walmart's, you got the Netflix's, of course. And um, for those of you that don't know, Gartner released a report last year, which was that by 2025, so very soon, that 50% of companies will be using GraphQL. That is an insane yeah. stat. What do you think about that, Keith? I mean, yeah, I think we're tracking towards that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we're on that trajectory for sure. I have, I have no doubt, you know, and you have to think about when Gartner is looking at their client base, like that's the full spectrum, right? <laughs> like there are a lot of companies that like are still running mainframes, right? Are that are just thinking about containers and just thinking about this change from monolith to microservices and this kind of thing. And um, so, but even for those companies, they will eventually modernize. And I have no doubt that they will land on GraphQL because for them, it won't even be a transition. They didn't start with, you know, rest, right? You know, and then they're like, okay, how do I balance the needs of like, I, I don't think it is ever like I replace all my rest APIs or HTTP based APIs with GraphQL. Like, I don't think that's, you know, necessarily ever the right choice, but it is saying like, where does GraphQL make sense in my architecture? And clearly it makes better sense in certain areas of your architecture. Totally agree. And I mean, they have access to insane amount of data. So if they're projecting that 
like I can even see being a more like 60 and then by 2030, you can imagine, you know, 80% of companies because it, it makes sense at a global scale. It makes sense. And exactly what you said. I mean, fantastic answer. And then, so let's transition back to open source because I love that you created this open source product when you were, this was at um, Red Hat, correct? You had an open yeah, source yeah, product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me about that. So it's interesting. So it was um, a project called SwitchYard. Like I think in the, in the realm of like, you know, things that we can consider like blowout successes versus failures, I think ultimately that turned out to be a failed open source project, right? Like I think we had like good use and like good momentum behind it, um, but I don't think it achieved escape velocity um, just because we never, like we got into product, customers were using it, like that was all good, but like we just couldn't get it and it was an awesome learning experience i mean painful as well like when you like invest all your time and energy in something and then it doesn't turn out right you know it's uh it is what it is it's part of the game right um but it's uh the, the premise behind switch yard is essentially there's a very popular integration framework in the apache community called apache camel and at the time a um most of the existing enterprise application integration frameworks or like esbs enterprise service buses uh, we're using higher level tooling to enable like business analysts and people that want to look at like more the SOA or service oriented architecture view of applications. Um, they, uh, Camel wouldn't be used by them because it had no tool chain around it. It had no like standard definition of like configuration, like you wrote the code, you know, to basically, and it was great. It's super powerful and awesome. And subsequently, I think people have implemented that on top of Camel. Uh, so we came at it from that direction and like we're, and we found uh, success in users that wanted the power of Apache Camel, but wanted the higher level interface. But I just don't think that market turned out to be as big as, as we thought it was going to be. So, you know, great learnings along the way, but just one of those things you have to look at it as a journey and the learnings from afterwards. Totally agree. And there's a great essay by um, A16 that says the three things that you need for a startup are a great team, a great product, and a really good market. But if you had to pick one, the most important is the market. And I totally agree with you on that. But so you said a successful open source, um, I guess, project or even like company. So in your eyes, what is a successful open source project? Like what does it have from the beginning to escape or to get that escape velocity to become, you know, like a mainstream product? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So like, I'm sure going to miss out some on some things here, but just some things that are top in my uh, top of mind. Um, Participation in the community is vitally, vitally important. Um, it's like you can see some extremely popular open source projects out there uh, that are single vendor led, right? And they'll go a long way. I mean, like we're talking big projects here. Like if you look at Confluence involvement in the Kafka community as an example, right? Like, you know, they have a ton of the committers. Like a lot of people that didn't even work at Confluent, which, which became committers, Confluent say, hey, come work here. And they're like, yeah, that's awesome. Confluent sounds like a great place to work, right? So I think you can definitely have um, uh, situations where, um, you know, a single vendor uh, like has most of the contributors. I don't know if that's necessarily a healthy thing from an overall community standpoint, but like it could totally work like that. But in that case, the community isn't just code contributions. It's use of it, feedback, you know, helping with the docs, you know, like helping answer questions in the community and this kind of thing, right? So I think that like that, that community uses a proxy for like no one's doing that if they're not using the software, right? So like, you know, as a predicate to that is that someone's actually using it, right? And then once you have that and, and users are contributing back and participating in the community, that's a key health signal, absolutely. I also think you need external validation in terms of larger companies, you know, logos that are like, hey, we run our business on this. And that gives you like credibility and people are like, I'm not the first one trying this and this type of thing. So I would say that, you know, more than anything, focusing on that community of use uh, is, is super, super important. And I would agree. So community, um, there's a really good quote by Adam. He said, which might kind of contradict what you said, but he said, if there's only people from the organization talking about that product or they're only talking about your product, he goes, that's not a community, that's a cult. What would you say about that? <laughs> you know, I like this gets into an interesting area. Cults can be highly effective, you know, depending on, yeah, you know, maybe yes. not ethical, but like, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, I, I think that uh, there, I mean, just from a pure OSS perspective, right? There's a balance that comes with equal weighting in the community in terms of the future and direction of that community, right? And that can be realized in a couple of ways. 
But I think we can all recognize that if you have a single vendor driving an open source community, um, that it's a risk. Let's just say it's a risk. It's an existential risk that, you know, that that, that, that can happen. Um, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I will say that I've been involved in many open source and standards efforts where progress is impossible because everybody has an opinion and you just get deadlocked and you can't go anywhere, right? So there's also, you know, maybe two stages on this journey, right? Of like getting to escape velocity with a single vendor, most likely pushing the open source community to where it needs to go. And then saying like, okay, we just, we, we're there and a lot of people using us. And then how are we broadening the representation here to like make it maintainable and sustainable for the long term? Um, I also think that it's like, it's not as clear as it used to be in terms of like, now we see open source projects that are composites of other open source projects. So if you look at Glue yes. as an example, right? It uses Envoy proxy underneath the covers. We contribute to Envoy upstream and, you know, we're like, uh, so we're there in that community, but then we're also building a control plane and additional extensions on top of Envoy um, in open source as well. So yeah, a lot of different looks at it, I guess. No, yeah, fantastic answer. And I would also agree, like like you said, a cult may be unethical in whatever sense it could be, but cults can also be a good thing. So, you know, if it's productive, but the biggest point was, um, yes, when you get so many people involved, even making a small decision, you know, it, it gets a little bit tricky. And if you want for the better good, sometimes you have to do that. So I would agree with that. And then back to open source, because I don't know, for me, I love open source. You said that it's important to get large organizations using you, getting that external validation, that large organizations are adopting you, that they're using you, that they're using you in production. But what about large organizations using you and not paying you at all? What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Does that still count or is it important to get that monetary commitment? Yeah, that's, it's funny because this is a... I mean, it's an age old question in open source, right? Is like, how are you monetizing? So I, I've experienced this in a couple of different ways. In Red Hat, it was, everything was open source. Like no code was proprietary. Um, even that started to get a little blended as you look at like managed cloud services and the stuff that the SRE team is using to run the services. Is that, do you open source that? Is it closed? You know, it's kind of thing. But I think it's safe to say that at Red Hat, um, you know, everything was 100% open source, right? And, and if it wasn't, there was an intent to eventually make it open source. So like maybe after an acquisition temp temporarily that is that company's closed source is closed. But then like I witnessed this myself when we acquired 3Scale when I worked at Red Hat, like there was a concerted effort that was a lot of engineering time to open source that product and get it, you know, out there. So uh, they take that very seriously where I think, but Red Hat, many times people talk about Red Hat as being like a one-shot deal. Like, no other vendor has been successful with that approach. It was just kind of like, you know, right place, right time. Mm -hmm. And I think where you see the most success now is open core models, where companies will bring a technology in open source, um, then say, okay, the community can use this and be useful to a lot of people. And maybe there's, you know, different um, uh, vendors that might participate and, and productize that out in the community. But then each vendor will hold something back and that will be part of their enterprise offering built around that technology, right? Um, and even that we've seen some recent developments. I mean, if you look at Hashi and BSL and this kind of thing, you know, and like, you know, like, you know poison pills against SaaS providers and like hyperscalers using open source projects, like this is all in the mix, right? And it's, I think it's, yes. again, I actually don't feel that there's a, you could argue that both ways, like when a, uh, you know, a hyperscale, I don't want to name specific, you know, vendors here, but when a hyperscaler picks up an open source project and makes it as a part of their catalog, that adds a lot of shine and attention in that community. That's a huge install base that you can now address, right? So it's, uh, yeah, I guess that's, we're getting at like kind of the push pull of the community and the enterprise sort of uh, interest there. Yeah, I think you're spot on. So it's tricky. So like um, long time ago, actually, I don't think it was a long time ago, but Mongo, they created the Elastic license because Amazon was taking their open yeah. source offering, repackaging it and selling it to their customers and paying zero dollars to MongoDB. So they created their own license. And that makes sense. And then the HashiCorp one is interesting because the original founders aren't still a part of the team, but they had their opinions on Twitter. I don't know if this was a shareholders agreement because they're public now, but yeah, like um, open source is difficult. And a good friend of mine, Dax from SST, he told me when you make an open source product, you have to expect that 99% of people won't pay you a cent. Yeah, 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 that's fair. Yeah, it's, I mean, but that's actually in some ways a very pot, like open source is an avenue to engage with users and customers basically. Like, and you have to look at it like that. And so you're almost, you're proving yourself at two phases there. You're kind of saying like, 
hey, you found value in this technology. And based on our experience with customers, let me tell you what your next three steps of your journey are going to be like. And you're going to need these other things as well, right? And it's all still built around that core of that open source technology. And you're just providing some additional value out on top of it. So I think it can be a very healthy thing. Um, and, and, it's, and it's good to have, I, I mean, it's absolutely a positive force to have vendors invested in open source and, and improving around it. Totally agree. I mean, you might not get any monetary commitment, but you'll get feedback and you'll get usage and you'll get, you know, issues that they're running into and they're providing this to you for free just for using up the product. So it's definitely a different avenue that you can take. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And in, in, the funny thing is in that process, you also start to explore what are the high value items you can build around it, basically, right? You know, like people keep reporting issues in this particular area and you're like, oh, that's maybe some additional value we can we can provide around it. Yeah, love that. And then, so it's what... I love what you said about Red Hat. Like, <laughs> that is the de facto of a successful open source company. Like, they open source everything. Early on, how were they making money, though, to get all the way up to IPO and to open source everything? Was it through support contracts? Yeah. Like, they would literally, like, I, just was, I wasn't there at this time, but like in the original times, they were basically just like creating floppies and like CDs and mailing it to the, I think they were selling shirts <laughs> and they were also doing support, right? Like, they were doing what else, right? Like, and, um, so, and then even then after that, like the value of the subscription is support, but it's also training, engagement with the team, right? Like it's uh, like all these other things that Red Hat provides on it. But like, I would say that support is obviously a huge component of that. And, and that support includes, you know, the, uh, the backporting of fixes to prior versions, larger companies need, you know, N minus four kind of support you need it, you know, some customers need like 10 year life cycles. I think rail probably has, um, so Red Hat Enterprise Linux probably has like some crazy like 13 year life cycle or something like that, right? Cause you like put it in a car or a toaster or something like that. And you're like not gonna upgrade it to a new version. You just need patches on it, right? No, totally agree. And like for me, um, I don't know. I, I struggled a little bit with support because support's fantastic. You're getting user feedback. You're even getting paid feedback. They're telling you mm -hmm. what they pay for and what they would like. But does it ever transition into a spot where you become more of a consulting company versus a, a tech for sure. company? Yeah. That's, yeah. Talk to me about that risk. I think it's mainly like, I think the focus with customers there is stressing the importance of partnership around the features that they need, right? And I, I think in my mind, customers, if I was a customer, I like the idea of consultancy and services and support because I'm staying close to open source and not binding myself to a specific vendor, right? But there is just only so much. Like if you really, and again, that could be an incremental step. You can start that as a proving ground of like, okay, I feel comfortable. I've adopted the right technology. But then there's some things you're going to need that the upstream just simply cannot provide and services are not going to do it for you. Like, let's say you need, um, you need, N minus four, like you have a three, you know, three versions back, basically the community is no longer supporting it. No one there's going to take a PR that's going to upgrade a dependency or add a specific or backport a feature. And you need someone to provide that to you basically, right? There could be features that the upstream has determined is outside of their scope of what they want to provide. So let's say the upstream has decided we're the best solution for single cluster deployments and everything that happens with multi-cluster is up to someone else that's deploying this as part of their solution, right? So then vendors need to fill that space, which is a very enterprise-y type of thing. Um, so yeah, I think that's very important to stress with customers that you have to get to the level of partnership. Um, the, the model where you're just services, I've seen this as an anti-pattern so many times where maybe you have like a systems integrator that's taken an open source project, added a bunch of stuff to it to uh, satisfy a given customer. And then they're like, they're running it for a year or two. And then they're stuck on that version because all the things were written for that version. Now they need to upgrade to get some new stuff or have it be supported again by the community and they can't move. And now it's another services thing. And for that SI, it's a real problem because you go, they deal with many customers, how many forks and how many specific versions are you supporting at one time, right? And again, this all goes back to the vendor relationship and having a trusted partner to say like, okay, you know, we're with this together. I have, you know, three to five year timing or planning horizon. This is where I want to get as a company, right? Are you the right partner to support me on that entire journey end to end? I can't stress that enough. I mean, partner is super important. Like for us, we do Slack connects with our partners, anyone that's doing support and we're in constant communication because they're giving us feedback. They're giving us features. We talk to our other partners. Is this a feature that you want? But for me, 
I love what open source brings to the table. And I love also how Solo is doing a similar approach. And so Solo is quite successful. It might be a startup, but it has achieved some amazing momentum in the last couple of years. Like it's going fantastic. Would you guys say now though, you guys are more for focused towards enterprise or would you be more focused still bottom up approach? What's the growth model for Solo and where do you guys see yourself? In, and I'm not gonna say five years because startups are so fast. So where do you see yourselves in six months? Yeah, it's, so I, I feel that we're what we're really hitting now is the market's ready for the full vision, right? So I mentioned before that like Gateway was a big focus for a long time. And I think we definitely have seen that like service mesh and like certainly cloud adoption, you know, is there. And as what's funny is as companies go on that journey, it's not a big bang and they're not shifting everything at the same time. And so they still have all these like legacy workloads running in VM. So all of this now is, is coming to the forefront. And, and I think that it's, uh, it's great to see because we've been building that for years. Um, so I think in terms of what the next six months, year, two years uh, are, is just a continuation of that journey uh, for us, which is fantastic. We're already a, you know, a unicorn, like, you know, we have billion dollar valuation. So I think it's great, like the size that we're in terms of the customers we have, um, the, the, our customer base, the, the funding that we have, the, the size we've grown to um, is, is been, has been great. Yeah. So I think we're really hitting our stride and just ready to take off the, the next step function of growth. And I would totally agree. I mean, the growth has been rapid, you know, unicorn valuation, the founders presenting at a brand new conference, GraphQL Conf. What I love about Solo is, you know, you have everything of the big ship, but you operate like a small ship. And then, you know, yeah. just fantastic. I mean, amazing. And then so now with Solo, like, what do you, do you guys more focus on open source from the bottom up? Or is it now like, oh, sorry, I forgot you. It's both directions. Yeah, yeah. So we okay. have an entire team dedicated to upstream contributions across like Cilium, Istio, Envoy, like across the open source uh, components that we that we use in our stack. And a big part of our thing, going back to like the partnering model, is the engagement with customers, not just like, hey, okay, yes, we provide enterprise support for these technologies. Yes, we have additional product value add on top of that in the form of our product. But one of the biggest thing is that these, for many companies, are still very new technologies. Where you talk about GraphQL or Istio or whatever, right? And so, like partnering with customers to like basically say, okay, here's what we've seen all these other customers, and we think this is what's going to be successful for you based on our experience there. And then also, how do you skill up those customers who are new to these technologies? Because it's not just one person that's going to be implementing this. They need to skill up their teams basically. And so. We take our experience with upstream technologies and having like leaders and experts in the upstream technologies and then partner with those customers to basically train up and skill up their, their developers. And then when those customers say like, hey, I need these features in the open source communities, well, we're committers and we're key influencers in those upstream communities. And so uh, we, can, we can advocate for them in those upstream communities as well. And so it doesn't really matter to us to answer your question directly. Like we're happy to start with a customer that's going bottom up, you know, and it's like, Hey, I'm starting with the open source and I want to grow from there. And then like, but increasingly we're seeing customers when we present our vision, they're like, I'm doing all of that. Right. And I'm starting with the product offer. Right. And knowing and having the confidence that's built on these open source technologies, but I immediately already have these needs for multi-cluster, multi-tenancy, you know, for GraphQL, like we built, uh, so like talking about GraphQL specifically, uh, we built a full GraphQL server into Envoy itself. So it's a C++ filter in Envoy that basically eliminates the extra hops to separate GraphQL servers. All of it executes in the proxy at the same time you're doing rate limiting and security and data exfiltration controls and all these other things that you use a proxy for, but you have a full GraphQL server built in there as well. I love that. And there was a point you said before that I think is so important to stress. So founders and founders of successful companies, successful product managers, they look at the niche. And so you guys started with an API gateway and you did that perfectly. You didn't go and you didn't slam the vision in front of people. You didn't try to convince them yet. Instead, you took a small niche. And if you look at Amazon, they did the same thing. They started with books. If you look at Netflix, they started with DVDs. They knew their brand vision was to eventually sell everything or to you know, get people on a streaming platform. They saw the future, which is amazing because you're seeing the same thing as Solo. They started with an API gateway, but the grand vision will eventually be this giant service mesh that covers everything. Is that correct to say? It is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, um, like here's, let's tie a couple of things together here. We look at service mesh specifically. There's actually some very cool ways that GraphQL operates within a service mesh for inter-service traffic. So like one of the common anti-patterns in networking is like this concept called hairpinning, where you basically might, might take through North South, you have an ingress or a gateway point that's taking external traffic in. 
and you want those same controls for internal traffic as well. And so anytime a service needs to talk to another service, it has to go back up. It does this hairpin maneuver of going back up through the top, basically, right? And so one of the cool things with, uh, with Istio, it has two modes. One is it can have a sidecar next to every service and we can execute GraphQL in that sidecar, right? So if you're using like a composite API that's stitched multiple individual GraphQL APIs, all, you don't have to go back out to the top and have a next separate dispatch. You can execute all that in the sidecars independent or as a single request. So that's actually like a really cool, like, you know, efficiency that is only enabled by being able to run adjacent to those workloads in the sidecar. Um, and we do the same thing in a, a new deployment mode called Ambient uh, for Istio, where you have a node level proxy instead of a sidecar for every service, which has some performance benefits in terms of the resources involved. But ultimately, they kind of both do the same thing. Love that. And then, I mean, it, it's amazing what you guys are doing. It's really exciting to, you know, even be able to watch you guys and to interview you. But I want to transition back to your role. So you have this insane knowledge. You have this insane developer knowledge. Do you also hop on sales calls as well or like customer success calls? Oh, totally. Yeah. But, and that's what I love about product is that you can yeah. be involved in all of those things. Right. But at, at a startup more than more than ever. Uh, so, yes, I have my I try to get involved in everything I possibly can. And I love talking to customers like any product person, like, you know, if they're not obsessed with talking to customers and getting feedback from customers and understanding what customers want, you know, I think that maybe they are choosing the wrong line of work. <laughs> you have to want to talk to customers all the time. I would totally agree. I mean, customer conversations are my absolute favorite. But one thing that I do run into sometimes, and I want to know if you run into this, is do you ever get the, the, the build versus buy where they would rather go in and they would rather build it themselves? And how do you, in a very polite way, tell them, it's not a good idea, or maybe it is a good idea. Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, we, this does come up for sure. Um, and it definitely comes up like the, the profile of that customer is that they tend to be more on the software side already, right? And maybe very advanced in their particular market segment. They could be a leader in that market segment. So they have the staffing to like, they have brilliant people that they can apply to any problem, right? Yes. The question is where, like, building their own solution, does that differentiate their product in their market segment at all, right? Like, yeah, maybe they could build this own thing that they, you know, that is great for their use case and they maintain on their own, but it's providing no direct product value to their customers or end user value, right? And those very smart people should actually be working on things for their product, uh, you know, and, and providing value to their users. And so that's generally where we center that, that that conversation. And even if those customers need to heavily, like not even heavily, just customize the solution and they're still writing some code or adding some services on top, you're raising the foundation from what you're building, right? You're not starting down here and building all the way up, right? You're starting up here and just adding the extra stuff you need on top. So I would say that's generally how the conversations goes. It's just helping that, that customer understand that, you know, they want top line growth. They want additional revenue and provide additional value to their own customers. And the fastest way to get there is to use best of breed solutions that they can build on top of. That's a perfect answer. I mean, if you were selling solo to me and I had that issue, I would definitely be like, okay, let's go for it. <laughs> right. uh, funny, or funny thing that happened to us is we were dealing with a large uh, fashion company and the CTO goes, I'm in the fashion industry. I'm not in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. and that handled that right then so when you work with people with that mindset they totally understand it because you know they're dealing with millions of requests or even billions of requests and it's for fashion it's not for tech they don't care they just need to have their problem solved yeah and it's i think you know prior experience in these customers also can dictate it it's the proficiency of their teams but also have they been burned by another solution recently right where they're like oh my gosh like this thing is t always taking me down and I don't want to own it, but I have to own it because it can't take you down, down. And so then that's helping customers understand we have the expertise, like we have the you know customer references and like customers running this like tier zero at high volumes and stuff. So you're just trying to, you know, it's a credibility and confidence conversation more than anything. Um, and then I think sometimes customers might not be thinking in layered terms that they think they have to implement that layer. And so then it's just, an, again, an, a conversation of understanding where they contribute at what layer, level of the stack. Exactly. I love that. And then, so when you get on these customer calls, how, and like a very important thing is like, they'll give you feedback. They'll be very nice with you because nobody wants to be, you know, awkward on a Zoom call. How do you filter through all of the things that they're saying and really find their deep pain point? Is there like a framework do you use or just based off your experience or do you have any tips for people to really dive deep into customer calls and really understand 
what is their problem? What is their budget? Who's the decision maker? And how can I help them solve this problem? Yeah, it's a, I've looked at it. I would definitely recommend to everyone to look at frameworks. And it's so funny. I've looked at like so many frameworks that I've forgotten all the frameworks. Basically, I've created this like Frankenstein like model of, of frameworks that I, that I use. But it's, um, I, I think you could simplify it into like, like listen first, right? And be confident in the value you provide. If you're listening first and being confident in the value you provide, like, the rest will sort itself out. Cause like, it's more the mistakes that people make. Like they show up and they just barf out what your solution does. And they get like real technical at first. Like if they happen to be a technical PM, like love going into the details, talking technical, want to impress people and this type of thing. And you're really just like, you're missing the opportunity to identify customer pain, right? Understand where a customer needs to go, where they're struggling and this type of thing. And so you know, there's all these models for like, you know, key buyer criteria that you need to satisfy, you know, like the timing and the budget and, you know, the need and all that kind of stuff. But like putting that aside, just literally having a conversation with a customer. And sometimes that involves up leveling the customer, right? You have to say, they're like, we're coming and we had this issue of production and the P95 latency was this and it needs to be this other thing. And like, how do you solve for that? And it's like, okay, that's a cool question. We're going to get to that level of detail, but like, let's step up, take a step back and like talk about where you're trying to go overall. Right. Because that customer going back to what I said initially, like, like customers understand their business problems better than anybody else because they're successful in those areas and they might have specific technology, you know, kind of needs, but they may not understand the full set of tools at their disposal. And that's the job of the provider to come in and say, okay, I understand your business needs and I am an expert in this set of tools. So let me talk to you about how they can be used. And then the buyer can make an educated, educated choice around, you know, whether that, that will satisfy their business needs. I love that. And one framework that I'm a big fan of is the mom test. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it. You most likely have. But for those of you who haven't, go on Amazon and get this book, especially if you're talking to customers, because it, it's a three-step framework. You know, identify what they're currently doing. Be like your mom and you know, give no sympathy to them and just ask questions and just really listen. And it's a fantastic framework. But um, so I'm looking at the time. We're almost at time. So at the end is just a little bit of fun question. So we have three minutes. So Keith, outside of solo, what is an interesting hobby or something interesting that you do that people don't know about you? I rode bikes for a really long time, like road cycling, uh, which was a ton of fun. Um, and then just randomly fell into doing jujitsu, uh, like Brazilian jujitsu. Um, and it is, uh, like, it's a blast. Like it is, uh, so like I started it way too late in life. Like definitely when you're more flexible and younger and you heal faster, you should start it younger in life. Uh, but I've heard it described and it's funny because now like Mark Zuckerberg and like people like yeah. you know, are, are kind of doing it now. Right. Uh, but this is probably like six or seven years ago that I got into it. And I actually understand now this is a common thing uh, that I talk to other parents that get into it. I went for my daughter. She saw it and wanted to like, you know, join and stuff. And when I was in there, then they were given a tour. They were like, you should try it too. And then I ended up doing it. My daughter didn't, <laughs> she, just, she stopped. Um, but people describe it as, as chess with your body, which is a, perfect description of it it is so amazing to think about like we sit in chairs all day long and do all this kind of stuff that like is not or even have a stand-up desk you're still like kind of like sedentary basically right and um like getting back in tune when you were like a child of using your body fully and understanding like and getting coordinated and stuff it's fantastic like it's it's it's, it's a really cool martial art and uh, definitely has something i'd recommend for everybody love that and then in your free time like Obviously, you have children, you know, you're doing jiu-jitsu, you have an amazing job. Do you still program in your free time or do you work on any small open source offerings now or anything like that? I don't. I uh, like, I mean, for demos and stuff, like really light stuff, like I'll do, but like I don't have any side hustles like or side gigs. Uh, and it would be fun. I just find that like, as you were mentioning, I'm time constrained. Like I feel like, you know, every day I'm saying like, what is the best use of my time? And unfortunately, it just doesn't go there. Um but soon, like, I, I feel like we'll, we'll get back to that. I need to pick up Rust or do something cool. Like, I, I need to, like, experience newer languages that I, I, was, I haven't played around with before. Well, if you want to pick up Rust, we just, we're adding, I think, this week the, the Rust SDK. So you'll be able to use WonderGraph with Rust. So you can try that. <laughs> right, right on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then last question. So 
obviously you're in the tech space, you see all the trends and things like that. Are there any tools or frameworks or up and coming startups or even established companies, you know, like we're selling solo that people should take a look at and kind of see their interest in? Ooh. Or ones that you're even like fans of for their marketing. For me, like I like Drizzle, how they do their marketing. It's anti-marketing, but it works. Like anything like that. Oh man, I'm going to kick myself because this is a good question. And like, as soon as I get off, I'm like, I should have mentioned that. And um, I don't know, like nothing pops to me like on the top of my head. Uh, like I said, this is going to torture me. You have to have me on again. The first question you can ask me is like, by the way, that question I asked you last time, what's your good answer for it? <laughs> okay, fair, fair. We'll, we'll get a picture at GraphQL Conf and I'll be like, Keith said these technologies, take a look at them. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll do that. And speaking of GraphQL Conf, just, you know, for everybody, like, you know, it's next week in the Bay Area. So, you know, it's... Uh, like we're filling up and, and getting close to capacity, but there's still our, um, our seats left. So I hope that uh, folks maybe listening to this uh, will go out and, and join. And a big thing, like this is the first GraphQL conference, like official GraphQL conference from the GraphQL Foundation. And it's amazing the diversity of speakers we have um, just overall in terms of individuals. But then also if you look at the companies that are involved, you know, like multi-vendor, but then also, you know, like, Netflix, Meta, Wix, Intuit, Meetup, Booking.com, Coinbase, Salesforce, Atlassian, like that's not even all of them, but just like all these community users, right? So I think it's it's going to be a great event. You're just going to see a huge, like a, get the fullest possible look at, at, you know, GraphQL as a community there. Um, and we're going to keep that momentum going. We're rebooting or like trying to reinvigorate a bunch of meetups. So I think like the foundation has helped uh, advocate for like, the London and Amsterdam meetup just did one in San Francisco this week, I think already happened. Um, and so, uh, and past the conference, we want to keep that going. And I think the meetups kind of suffered during the pandemic, you know, people for, you know, for good reasons, people staying away from that in person. Uh, but now, you know, maybe we're getting back to a time where, where that's, uh, it's good to get back together again in person. So. Totally agree. And on the meetups, we're actually introducing a GraphQL Miami. So I will be hosting that Sweet. one here. So we don't know if we're going to do table service in a club like Miami Lifestyle. No jokes aside, we can not do that, but <laughs> it'll be a good time. And then second, Keith, make sure you stop by our booth. We have Federetzels. I'll let you think about what that is, but it's going to be amazing. I'm super excited. Sweet. That sounds great. Yeah, I'll definitely check it out. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, Keith, it was an absolute pleasure. I know it's a bit late now in London, but your answers were fantastic. I'm going to cut these up just so people can see how to talk to customers, the future of Solo, how to build an open source community. It was fantastic. Thank you again so much. Hey, Stefan, it was great talking to you. Thanks very much. Bye. Of course, of course. Bye.